Welcome to Portland Industry Insider. My name is Michael Verity and I'm your host. And our guest for this episode is a well-known casting director here in Portland, a former actor, which makes her much loved among actors. She's very sympathetic to uh, actors in the uh, audition process. It's, she's also a repeat offender. She was here with us for one of our early editions of The Insider. It's great to welcome back Lori Lewis. Thank you very much. So nice to have you here. Nice to be back. How have you been? Um, crazy in this new world we're living in. It's been interesting. It's nice to see people and to be out. Yeah, here we are. We're actually well, we're in the of, same room. We're and, kind of in that buffer zone. We're semi social distance. Well, you know? so, I don't think it's quite six feet, but we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> For people who don't know you, let's start out with a little bit of conversation about your experience in the industry, where you started, where you went, and how you ended up as. Lori Lewis, casting director, Free Spirit Casting, right? For those Free Spirit who are Casting not is the company, with. yes. Yeah. And then I'm the owner, casting director, you know, it pretty much. Yeah, right. I want to say, well, I came out of the womb saying to be or not to be, according to my sisters. <laughs> um, so um, I pretty much, you know, came out acting and I've been acting my whole life. Um, I always thought it'd be just, that was it, my end all be all. I was going to be a famous movie star and this and that. Mm -hmm. And then I started to pursue my acting and I was getting some knowledge and acknowledgement for my skills. And I discovered I don't like being famous. <laughs> I don't okay. like to be well known. All right, all right. So, um, and then on top of that, then I discovered I have like allergies. So I had to change courses. I can't wear a lot of makeup. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. makeup in acting is like heavy duty. And so it'd sure, be sure. like terribly frustrating for the makeup person. They'd put it on me and then the makeup be all melting off because my eyes would be running. So I had to shift gears. As much as I love acting, I knew I had to switch gears. And so then I stumbled into casting. Um, I moved up here um, in, to Portland in 2001. Went to work for Extras Only, Danny Stoltz. Oh, okay. um, mm -hmm. Did Extras casting on The Ring which was my first experience, my first experience in casting and then working with DreamWorks and then having um, a high level executive producer scream at me for an hour when she was not happy with Danny about something. And um, I still came back to casting. And you and still came back it. to it anyway. <laughs> so then after extras, extras casting, I then segued in and worked with Lana Vinker for a long time when it used to be Lana Vinker casting, it's now um, Cast Iron. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I worked with her for six, six and a half years and then I went my own way and started my own casting business in 2013. It seems that um, your experience of deciding you didn't want to be famous, is that what most actors are thinking when they go into it? Not most, thankfully. Okay. I, think, I think just a few, just a handful go after it for the fame. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I was younger and going after it, it was a whole different ballgame of how you became famous. Now you can have no skills, no nothing, you just don't go out and be this thing called an influencer, and the next thing you know, you're super famous. As so. long as you get 250k yeah, away at the top of your Instagram, it, exactly, you're going to get cast. <laughs> well, you're going to be an influencer, and they're actually starting to look for that in casting sometimes, which I thought was very interesting because they're not actors and they don't really know how to act. And so it's interesting what producers think they want, mm -hmm. but um, no, thankfully most actors going into the industry today. Um, and who've been pursuing it for a while really just love the craft and they love doing it. Mm -hmm. And then if you get recognized from it, that's a side aspect of it. And then that's where it gets tricky for a lot of them to handle that when they do hit that level of recognition. So right. the really brilliant ones are the ones that are the ones who are usually have the toughest time handling being famous. Sure, sure. It's my experience that actors, as a rule, tend to be more observant Rather, you know, they're, I, people come to me and say, my kid is so funny at the dinner table, he's going to be a great actor. And I said, well, is he paying attention to what's going on around him? <laughs> because mm -hmm. the brilliant actors seem to be as observant as they are outgoing. Is that an accurate oh, observation? Oh, absolutely. Because you're, part of what makes you being a really good actor, and, and I was good at it in my day, is that you're present. You're right there present watching everything. And it's one of the reasons I'm a really good casting director is because that same skill of watching and being really present and seeing what's going on in your environment, I use it now in casting. So that's why I catch a lot of things that other people don't catch. Right. And why producers love me is because I am really aware of everything going on. And I'm thinking about things that they haven't even thought about yet. Mm -hmm. And so yes, the brilliant actors are super intelligent. Most, of them, most mm -hmm. of them. You might find somebody who's not really on the high IQ level, but they're, they're hysterically funny and brilliant actor in other ways. Um, but the really, really good actors are super smart. They're very empathetic. 
Mm -hmm. And they are very much aware of their environment, and they're usually pretty active in it. And they usually don't want to have all the excess stuff that goes along with it, but they realize that to be really good at their craft and to get where they want to go and do the rules they want to go with, that's kind of the flip side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I have children, adult children who are actors, and, and my daughter is like, I don't want to be famous, I just want to work. Which is, which is, I would say, 99% of the talent yeah. pool. Let's talk about the influencer thing. That's not on the script, but let's, let's get into that anyway. Where do you, how do you feel about that as far as, uh, let, me ask this, let me ask it this way. Do you get pressure from producers or people involved in projects to give more attention to or to push down the road the person with the 250,000 followers on Instagram as opposed to the somebody who's maybe a better actor? I get asked for, like sometimes producers will say I want to see this person and I want you to bring in this person or I'm, I'm really curious because you know they've got this following is that. I'm sure I'll bring them in I'll, mm. I'll, or I'll let them you know self tape. Sure you have somebody you want to see? Great. I don't push them and I don't object to them. I just let it be. I just like my feeling is my job is to do my job is to bring them the best people for the job. So if they have certain people they want to see, I'll go ahead and bring them in and I'll make like them see them because in the back of my mind I know they're not going to be the ones that's going to get cast. Okay. So I'm going to go along with it and mm -hmm. I'll do what the producers want, I'll give them what they want and then I will make sure that I put in front of them the right talent for the cast. And I mean, I have this happen all the time. I'll have producers not just influencers. I had a job last year, a huge job. Um, for Holland America, I can now say what it is, because Holland America Cruise Line shooting out of uh, Fort Lauderdale, and I got to cast it from here. Mm -hmm. Well, they called me and they said, well, we don't want to do model -y types this time. We want really good looking actors. And I turned to my gal who's assisting me, I said, no, they don't, they want models, but we'll give them what they're asking for. But mm -hmm. we'll be ready to go with the models. And sure enough, we gave them a whole bunch of good looking actors, and they're like, these people aren't pretty enough. Mm -hmm. And so we just then threw all the models at them. So same thing with influencers. Whatever the client asks for, we give them what they want, but we also make, at least I do, make sure that there's solid talent there so that once the producers and directors and the clients see who they think they want, because, ooh, it's got all this following, mm -hmm. but they can't really pull it off, then they're like, oh, yeah, this is where we should have gone. Gotcha, gotcha. So how, universally speaking, and then specific to you, the casting director's role is how would you define that for someone who's because we really you know the point of these interviews is really to help actors understand the industry as as best as we can help them understand it exactly right so there's the question universally what is the casting director really what happens universally and then in your particular instance and are they different okay so Actors tend to be really afraid of casting directors, which is really sad. <laughs> You're so scary. I mean, I know. I know. <laughs> which is so intimidating. Oh my God, I, can't I, know. Even, I can't even handle it. So but, no. I think one of the reasons, and, you know, and, and I'm going to interject here, that you're, I talk to actors. People, you know, you, people say, oh, well, I've, tried, you know, I've auditioned for so and so and so mm -hmm. on. And universally, if they decide to get a little deeper into it, they say, well, yeah, Laurie is much more empathetic to what it's like to be in my space. Not better or worse than anybody. Everybody has their own style, but... That makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, back to the original question. Universally... Universally, I mean, um, if actors could just look at casting directors like they're an employment agency. Okay. Um, if I've worked for in, in temp employments and done stuff like that in my life. So pretty much we're kind of the same. We get, we get hired by the producers or the directors to find the right employees, the right cast, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then we have to look for them and we bring them in and we're basically the gatekeepers. There's this miscommunication, this confusion, because I get, I get thank yous all the time for casting them in a role and I didn't really cast them. I, ca I cast the project but the way I look at it and the way it really actually is, is we're the gatekeepers. We're the ones who decide who gets an opportunity at the job, mm -hmm. but we're never the ones who make the final decision on who books the job. And that would seem to be the error. That's the, in, the, in the mind of, of the, of the young actor. or the upcoming actor, that seems to be where the disconnect is, is that that casting director made the decision. Exactly. And, 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 um, and I hear actors say, oh, well, 
he doesn't like me or she doesn't like me because I auditioned for him or her X amount of times, this particular casting director, and I didn't get cast. So he doesn't like me. I'm never going to get the job. And that's not true. It's not true. And I know that from personal experience. <laughs> from it's not wa- true. From watching my own, my own kids work who have yeah. gone and auditioned for the same person over and over again, some of them pretty tough, who are like, nope. And then they're back again, and all of a sudden, it's the right time, the right place, and the, root, the space opens up for them, if that makes any sense. I would like to counter that thinking for actors. Instead of thinking of the fact that you've auditioned for this casting director, whoever it is, and I know who all the casting directors are in town. Sure, sure. Everybody is. So instead of thinking like, oh, I've auditioned for this casting director five times and he or she has never cast me, so they must not like me. Mm -hmm. The reality is, if they didn't like you, they would not be giving you another opportunity to audition. True enough. And there it is. So that's the... I would like them to switch that in their thinking. I see talent all the time. I, there's one actor I have brought in over and over and over, and I'm like, oh, I hope he gets it this time. And when he finally got it, I was like so thrilled. Mm-hmm. But it had nothing to do with liking him or disliking him, or the clients liking him, disliking him. You cannot know how many times that talent was so close to getting the job. But for, like you just said, for one reason or another, either the role, the mix of the rest of the cast, or whatever it is, it just didn't go their way. If a casting director doesn't like a talent, more than likely you're not going to get an audition opportunity. Right. So change your thinking on that. Okay. I remind I remind actors also that especially when you're dealing with kids, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but in on a lot of projects the adults get cast first and the kids get cast second. And if you don't fit the family fit the family, then it has nothing to do with whether anybody likes you or whether you're a good actor or not. And is, it, that, is it, that accurate? It can be where they go first or second, but a lot of the times, especially when we're working with kids and especially in this new world that we're living in, because there's COVID protocols on every set that you go on. Mm-hmm. Luckily, now I'm working with jobs where they're not mandating everybody has to be vaccinated because not everybody is vaccinated for one reason or another, and that's okay mm-hmm. because every production is doing COVID testing. So I have jobs where when they're looking for kids, they generally are looking for siblings now because it's a lot easier to make sure we have the siblings in place. I just actually did cast a job where it was two girls um, who were the featured extras and they knew that they liked them and then they knew that they had the mom and the, the, the two gals for the mom. So they definitely looked at the kids to match up with the parents. So in that case, they actually knew who the parents were, they were looking toward the parents, and then let's see who the kids are that are going to match with this, because they're featured extras. Right, right. Sometimes it's the reverse, where you're, it's the, if the focus is the kids, and we need to make that these kids, or the, you know, the cold commercial, the whole spot, or whatever it is, it's about these kids, and then the parents are more like the window dressing, then yes, they would cast the kids first, and then let's look for the parents. Mm-hmm. And yes, I've had it come down to simply the girl's eye color was not going to fit in with the family. Right, so whether it's adults first or kids first it's sometimes it does it sometimes it just doesn't matter (laughs) and sometimes it really you know people don't understand this but it literally sometimes comes down to height we Mm -hmm. just cast another i just finished casting another project can't wait to see it it's gonna be a hysterical commercial but even though we brought in this brilliant actor for doing it and he did a great job he was too tall they wanted the actor to be really shorter Mm -hmm. for that one role so the other actor who is playing opposite him was super tall and we had almost a foot difference in height. Mm-hmm. A lot of times they don't want that difference. They want everybody to be right close to the same height. But they liked that actor so well that on the spot in callbacks they had him do another role, which he ended up getting cast in. Right, and, then, and, that's, an, and I'm, that's a good point. A lot of times, um, and again, I know this from personal experience of my own kids, is that they'll read for one role, them that might not be a particularly good fit for that role, but you've got something that says, hmm, maybe this is a better choice exactly. than, than this. So I also said, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's, you just look a little bit too much like somebody that the director is uncomfortable with it, for one reason or another, you know, whatever, the, whatever their past history might be. And that's true. There's, you've got to understand this is an industry of a lot of personalities and very strong personalities. I mean, everybody does. I mean, everybody in this industry has an ego to a certain degree or not. Sure. And it's very true. It could be where the director just is like something about that person. Just doesn't feel right. Just doesn't feel right. And, and in today's age, with what we're doing with self-tapes and this and that and so on, I can tell you that a lot of the times in doing the self-tapes, and I know this is what we're going to talk about it, but sure, sure. one of the big things the producers and directors are always wanting, and which is a lot of times they bring them back to callbacks, 
is to get a sense of who they are as a person and get a sense of their personality. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to be on set and they want to be able to work with people they like and they, they know they can get along with. Yeah, a friend of mine, uh, another casting director who cast stage, um, you know, live theater, said, you know, once, I, once I've seen what you look like and I've seen your resume and I know that you have some, you know, level of experience, then my question is, do I want to spend time with you? Exactly. You know, and as, and as a headshot photographer, that's what I talk to new, young, upcoming actors is, is you know what? You, pick, you, either look, you either look right or you don't. You're either, you either fit the, the profile or you don't. And I can't do anything for you once you get in the room. But here, between you and me, what we can try to do is take that ego away and show the kind of person that you are. Exactly. And think about who you are as a person. As we're taking pictures, think about who you are as a person. What it is you're trying to convey to a casting director, to a director, to a producer, to the people involved in this project, any project. The, the best headshot I ever had when I was on the acting side was when the photographer, I mean, I will never forget the, the session because I'm sure you have, you know, different things, but literally he had an ironing board out in front of me with the, the drape thing over it. It was, mm -hmm. you know, and we we're standing there and we were doing stuff and it just wasn't working. So he started telling me these just silliest jokes. <laughs> I mean, the silliest jokes and some robot, 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 whatever, some Rob nasty, nasty okay. jokes, some nasty there jokes. There once was a, somebody from Yeah, Sony. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And he did something and I, I just went, I was like, went, what? And looked at him and he snapped it. And it was just, he caught my personality in that yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. He caught me saying with a smile and this and that because I was cracking up at his joke and my response was, and it was, it was the best headshot I ever had because my personality was showing through. Right. My, my actual, you just caught me off guard and I wasn't trying to be something and posing in this picture, which, you know, most actors are not models and that's doing still pictures is like modeling and it's like totally anti what we do. Right, 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 right. Um, we've, so the script says we talk about what's different since COVID, but one of the things we, you know, once you're on set, things are significantly different with testing mm -hmm. and, and I remember watching a film with my daughter a year or two back, and I liked, I watched the credits mm -hmm. because I feel that the people who, I feel all those people deserve my, it's, I, I watch them it's too. 60 <laughs> seconds for, or, or two minutes or whatever, watch it's the credits. It's very frustrating when they shrink them and then they roll them really fast. Yeah, so I noticed that um, this one movie which is set in high school, so there's lots of extras and so forth, there's like 20 medical people like which affects budgets, mm -hmm. 20 medical people for three months doing testing, 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 testing. So we know that on set is different. Uh, and we know that there are less and less in-person auditions, that self-tapes, self-tapes were always, I mean, self-tapes existed before mm -hmm. COVID because of people who were trying to win roles in other towns or other cities. But it seems like we're not going back. No, or, or, or generally? I, generally, I don't think we will. I mean, it may be... And why is that? Um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, and this was educational for me. Um, the gal who had helped me last summer, who came on for a couple of uh, months to help with, got really busy, she had worked on the East Coast a lot. And she goes, you know, on the East Coast and down in, you know, Florida and Georgia and everything, almost everything's self-taped. There's very rarely any in-person auditions going on, and it's been that way for years. So... My feeling is we're not going to go back that way to in-person tapes, I mean, in-person sessions for a couple of reasons. I can um, sit down and watch people's self-tapes and get through 150, 200 self-tapes in a day, whereas if I were seeing people and auditioning people, the maximum number of people that I might be able to see in one eight-hour session would be about 50. Hmm. Very well. There you go. So it, it, for me, I like it because it gives me an opportunity to see more talent. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I have... Which is not bad for the actor. Which is not bad for the actor. That is really a good thing. And, it, and even if I don't necessarily think the talent reson resonates for that project, and I've, I've seen them and I've made a note of it in my mind, and I'll know next time that they're maybe not right for a comedic thing, but let's look at them for this. Mm -hmm. So it gives me opportunity to... The clients get to see more talent. Which is not a bad thing for the which actor. Which is not a bad thing for the actor. So the clients are liking that they get to see more people. I like that I get to see more people. It's... Um, we don't all have to sit in a room together. One of my producers said it best. She goes, Lori, don't take offense, but we're kind of happy we get to do callbacks this way. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we don't like sitting in a room with you for 10 hours. But yeah, 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 <laughs> but here it is. Here it is. We, we can sit here and we can turn our screens off and 
face <laughs> sipping coffee or you know in our shorts or whatever right, right, it right, just, right, right. it's a much more and i will tell you this much i have found that the zoom callbacks that we've been doing virtual callbacks have been just much more relaxed for the talent than mm -hmm. they normally in in person yeah. because the producers and the agency people are much more relaxed mm -hmm. they're hanging out in their environment or wherever and they're having more fun yeah, and yeah, so yeah. when they're having more fun, then the talent are having more fun. It's just a much more relaxed environment. So self tapes are here to stay. Right. Unfortunately, there are some producers, casting, whatever out there that layer so much stuff on the talent that they're now having to be camera operators and lighting technicians and sound technicians. Which is exactly, which was going to be my next question. Where is the sweet spot? Because we can put up, we can put up backdrops and we can have panel lights and we can color correct and we, I mean, you all can do, actors can figure all that stuff out if they want to. Where's the sweet spot between way too much and I can't look at this? Exactly. Um, well, first of all, don't film in front of green screens. Don't film in front of green screens. Get that Don't folks. No film green screens. In front of green screens. <laughs> I said I was going to look at the camera, but I'm telling you all don't film in front of green screens. It makes you look horrible, first of all, because a green screen is meant for a certain purpose. Well, the other thing is, is this, and I know that I don't use green screens, but I know if you get too far back, it starts to get a green halo around you and then you have this fit. Yeah, it it's, just looks hideous. Yeah, yeah. It just okay. looks hideous. We're so, not going to do that, ladies no, and gentlemen. Don't do green screens. Um, okay, so you have to look at each job that comes in, and because I don't want to get actors in trouble for saying ignore when the requests come in and what they do. Of course. So there, you have to kind of do what they want. But if there's if some of the demands are too much, like you know, I, one of the actors I read on you know Facebook because I try to follow actors and pay attention to what their concerns are because it helps me be a better casting director. Sure. So you know, one of them they had to have like a reader and they had to have this and they had to have that and like well you know if you really can't get it the way they want. If you can, don't stress on it. Do the best you can. Right. Just do the best you can to meet whatever their requirements are. Mm -hmm. The most important things are is we've got to be able to see you and we've got to be able to hear you. There it is. So I have, I've tried to make it very easy when it's my casting jobs that I don't care if, I've literally had people send me tapes where they were sitting in their car. I had one gal do it. <laughs> she, okay. I had one gal, she was literally sitting in a closet. Um, it was where she could get the sound and this and that. And I was fine with it. Um, mm -hmm. As long as I can see you and I can hear you, then we have enough to be able to decipher if right. we need to see you for callbacks or if the clients go, oh, we liked it, but it was, this was distracting, then I can get an additional tape done. So I try to not make it be where the talent are having to really jump through, jump through a lot of hoops. Because it's about your acting skills, exactly. not about your filming skills. Exactly. I will tell you, I have seen actors go in and put in so many special effects and music <laughs> and slow-mo and all this. And I will tell you, it's, nice. it's entertaining for the people <laughs> on the other end. They mostly chuckle at it. Yeah. Um, that, but it's not necessary. If, if your focus is more on all the special effects versus your performance, you're going at it completely wrong. Right, and it's and though you may not intend it that way, you're covering something. You might be, you might be subconsciously covering up something. You know, a, a flaw in your craft. It looks like you're overcompensating for not being able to to really to, get at the character. To do the thing. Exactly. The thing. So you, the best way is 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 less is more. That's so true. That has not changed ever. Mm -hmm. That has been the, true since I started in this industry way back. Less is more. If you just are there present, you're doing the role. As long as we can see you, we can hear you. I don't care if you're dressed like the role. If you are, great for the clients. That mm. sometimes helps them. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't care if you have a reader or if you put the, t the lines on tape. I know other people do. But again, if the bottom line is you can't get a reader or you can't do certain things, do what you can and still submit it. And do the, focus on your performance. Mm -hmm. Focus on being that role the best you can be because that's what's going to get you the callback or that's what's going to get you the job. Not all the fancy effects you put on the, the tape. And honestly, we just fast forward through them till we get to the meat of what we want to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fast forward through the, the, the... I fast forward through the credits. Here's the person's name. Yeah, Here's yeah. the role they're playing. This is, I mean, literally people put in all this in writing and then music. Oh my God, do not put music. To right. <laughs> Yeah, it's as much as you may like Hendrix. As much as whatever that song is you like, the person watching it may absolutely hate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then yeah. your whole entire performance is colored by the fact that they can't get, it's happened to me. I've had to mute the sound because I just can't get past the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've gotten feedback from acting coaches, from casting directors, 
uh, referencing uh, how someone should look in their headshot. And what I'm hearing is, is that they want you to, I mean, this has always been the case, right? When, when someone comes in, when someone consults with me about what they should do, how they should look coming in for a headshot, it's always you should look like a polished version of yourself going into the room. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback where, because people are doing auditions on tape, they're doing more makeup and more hair stuff because they feel like they're in front of a camera now. But you've always been in front of a camera because you were in front of a camera in the audition room. Yeah. So are you finding people overdoing that as well, the hair and makeup part of it? I think people, I think, yeah, it's, again, actors are very sensitive and very um, fragile spirits. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. so they, they do tend to overcompensate when they're, they're out of their comfort zone. And let's face it, actors are out of their comfort zone having to do self-tapes. Mm -hmm. It's just most of them are. So just, just the biggest thing with headshots and what you look like on tape is you should look the same. You right. should look the same. If your headshot looks a certain way, and I've had this happen. I've, I've put somebody, a request out for somebody to self-tape. And they'll come in, and then I'll start watching it, and I'm like, this doesn't look like the person I asked for at all. Mm -hmm. And their hair will be a totally different color. Maybe it's purple now for some reason. Right. Or their haircut's totally different. Or due to COVID, they've put on 10 or 15 pounds. You know, you really got to keep that headshot current. You know, it's mm -hmm. really, really important. And you have to look like it. And absolutely no touch-ups. There's a wonderful actor, um, Todd Robinson, mm -hmm. who has a scar on his head. And for a long right. time, people would kept airbrushing it out mm -hmm. and don't that's like that's his character well yeah, that's what's there this yeah. is his character yeah, yeah exactly well i was talking i was talking with someone yesterday about they were asking me well what do you do to headshots when you go from what's in the camera to what comes out the other you know the finished product and i said well you know i i have this way of softening the edges of the, the color adjusting the color a mm -hmm. little bit just to just to soften the edges a little bit of the color of the face uh, and maybe brighten the eyes up a little bit because everybody's eyes, you know, not right. like scary bright, but brighten that up a little bit. And then, of course, people have, ac you know, when you have acne, people would like to have that because it's not permanent. Right. Acne, acne is permanent. I said, that's about the extent of what I do. The rest of the story is all about the light and, and mostly about getting us, getting both of us, photographer and talent, to let go of the whole ego thing about, is this going to, because uh, you know what, the truth of me is, sometimes I walk into a session, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to, I'm a little nervous if I'm going to make this happen. You know what I mean? You don't feel the vibe, right? Mm -hmm. And like, sometimes, you know, people I've known, like, oh, yeah, how you doing? We're, you know, we're nailing it. But sometimes you get new people and, you know, everybody has their days, right? And so I'm like, okay, we have to, we have to get to that spot to make it work and it seems to me that it's very similar the spot that we have to get to in a headshot session where we're both letting go of our egos to get what's really going on is the same thing that an actor needs to do in a self-tape situation it is you really it's it and and to um go along with um letting go of the ego and i just had a train thought but it went i'll figure it again but <laughs> it was like one of these i'm like oh my god i gotta tell him that but it's okay if i don't remember it's no big deal but yeah it's really just being yourself honestly m most importantly it's the same thing when i'm telling people when they come in they act and they're and they're auditioning and, and i thank you again for saying that you know i'm empathetic and stuff with that that's that's my goal i became a casting director to be the kind of casting director I never got to audition for as, a, as an actor, to be that empathetic casting director. And so the biggest, most important thing is you've got to be present. And so the same thing in taking the headshot. If you're outside of yourself, exactly, and if you're not really there being you, then the camera's not gonna, no matter what you do, you're not gonna get that picture. And as nervous as you are when you're like getting, um, that you don't know if it's gonna, I just remember the thought, as nervous as you are, that you're not gonna get the picture with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can guarantee you actors, every single casting director is just as nervous when we're casting a job that we're not going to find the right people. And that's so important to understand. It is, we're all in, it's like literally, 
I get, I do it, and, and I'm literally, as I'm watching things, and I'm seeing, okay, I like this person, I like that person, I'm waiting for that person, you know, that just blows me away, and I'm like, oh, okay, there's, and I love and it. And what if I don't get that person? And then, and then, <laughs> and then once I do, because I usually do, I mean, so far, I've, I've never, I've, you know, unless it's like the one with Holland, and they didn't want models, and then I had to reshift and send the models, but uh, I was ready. Uh. Um, usually the clients come back and say, great, we've got a good casting here, I don't have to, like, do additional casting. Um, but it's still, nonetheless, because this is the nature of the industry and we're our, our decisions that we've made, just like with the talent, they've made the self-tape and they've set it off to the casting director and they don't know and now they're worried. Mm. Well, we casting directors, we pull all this stuff in and we put it together on a link and we send it off to the clients and then that's when we get to start to worry. Right. And then we're like, okay, and my mantra is no news is good news. No news is good news. <laughs> if I don't hear from them saying, what the hell did you do? What were you thinking? Mm -hmm. Then I know that I've, I've hit the mark on the job and then yeah. I just have to wait to see who comes back in. And so I think if actors could understand that all of us and even producers, I mean, some of the producers I work with, they get, we were in a callbacks recently and they were so nervous with the agents in there. And this is producers I work with all the time and they're like just the most chill people. And the one was just like texting me constantly and like, stop. Right. <laughs> because he, and it was to me, it told me his nerves, his nerves were up. I think it's important for actors to understand that the people who are working them around, working around them, regardless of their experience, regardless of their name, regardless of all that, we're all invested, right? Photographers who take your headshot, casting directors who see you, directors, producers. I mean, depending, you know, as you go up the ladder, more and more money is involved, and more and more time is involved, and more and, and more stress, and more pressure, and more pressure, and so forth. So we're all invested. So when you walk into a headshot session or you walk into an audition, the people around you are as invested in the success of all of it and your success as you are. Exactly. And that's really an important thing to remember. It has always been true, and I think it will always be true. And I know it was said to me when I was on the acting side by casting directors, and I say it all the time. We are rooting for every single talent to walk in that door to blow our socks off. Right. To literally, for me, it's get the goosebumps. If I get the goosebumps, <laughs> yeah. then I know that I feel I it. know that feeling. Yes. Oh, you're, you know, your eyes are, there it is. Mm -hmm. I found you. I found exactly. you. That thrill. I know that. I know that. And then, and then it's like I once I've hit the goosebumps, and I know I've got that, and and, and I've got that with um, when I've been doing it in session, and I know it also when I'm watching self tapes. One thing I wanted to touch on because it was in the notes that Susan, how how do I take and bring my directing and how I am with actors for their self tapes? Because, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because you used to be very interactive. I am. Uh, you well, not used yeah. to be. You were very inter interactive with. I give Actors. direction. <laughs> you, give, you give direction when you're live. How do you? I give direction still. So basically, I do my utmost to when I send out self tape and directions that it has a little bit of a, uh, information about what the character is. So, mm. you know, this is what the character's like if the director's provided that to me. I provide the actor whatever directions have come to me from the director that the director's looking for because it's the same thing that happens when I'm in session. I know what the director's looking for and then I direct the talent in session to get it from them. So I put all this in writing and then I send it to the agents and say, if any of your talent have any questions whatsoever, get them answered before they start to tape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they should get their tapes in as quickly as possible. And there's a reason. Don't wait till the very end. Because <laughs> if you get your tape in earlier, and I can review tapes early, I do. And if I see something from somebody that I know is not quite there, but it's, it's, I know they can do better, I will immediately say to the agent, can you get them to redo it and redo it with these notes? Yeah. So I essentially right. give direction and have them redo the tape sure. with the notes I've given. Right. So I still try to do that, but unfortunately, most actors like to wait till the very last bit to get their tapes in. Yeah. Which is um, the next time we work together. Next time we sit down and talk, we can spend an entire, <laughs> entire, we can spend an entire interview about get your tapes in faster. Just, so. it's, the thing is, is I try to give at least three to four days. I know that's not true. Um, when I was doing the Hall American one, I literally had agents because I was, it was a nationwide casting. And I had agents from across the nation. I had one, oh, forget it, she wrote and she goes, if nobody else has sent this to you, I'm going to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Nobody ever gives us a week to get cast. I'm like, well, we're at a Thanksgiving. Yeah. Of course I'm going to give you a week. There you go. So if you're given the time, don't take all that time. Get it done as if like, you had to get it done overnight. Right. But get it done properly. And then that way, if the casting director likes what they see, but it's not quite there, I'm sure I'm not the only casting director that says, hey, can you get them to make some tweaks? 
Mm -hmm. I, I would think that would be kind of, yeah, I think most casting directors would make tweaks if they could. Right, right. So. I, you, you were one of the first people to do this with me back before COVID. Oh, yay. You are one of the first people to do this with me now that we've rebooted. I love talking with you. Oh, you are you. a wealth of information. You are so enthusiastic and and I appreciate how helpful you are to the actors in the community. I love actors. In your role as a casting director. So Well, thank you. I love actors. I'm one of them. I'll always be one of them. And it's one of the things I tell them when they come in or when I'm watching their tapes because I am one of you. You right. really can't hide anything from me. Right. I see it. And that right. again goes back to being an observant actor. If you're observant, you're seeing it and this is my other thing. I'm going to end it with this. When you're auditioning and when you're doing whatever you're doing for your role, whatever it is, if you don't believe what's going on, if you don't believe what you're doing, there's no way in hell that the audience is going to ever believe it. If it feels like something isn't working, then something is probably not working. Exactly. <laughs> My best auditions when I was an actor is I got done and I had no clue what I did. Well, it's true for photographers, too. If you feel like it's not working, then it's probably not. And exactly. you should probably take a, take a step back and go, why is this not working? And, and try something different. So anyway, it was great chatting with you, too. Thank you so <laughs> much for being here and being part of this. And, and best wishes for the rest of the year. Thank you.